Life sure gets busy, doesn't it? Well, we understand. With all the certifications you have, finding the right kind of continuing education that fits your schedule can be a real challenge. That's where the FlightBridge Ed podcast subscription comes in. For less than $5 a month, the FlightBridge Ed podcast subscription gives you top-notch accredited CE while you listen. Visit flightbridgeed.com for more information or to sign up today. The FlightBridge Ed podcast subscription, another way we're being your partner in discovery. The content of this podcast is based on medical fact and evidence-based practice from credible authoritative sources, but is not a substitute for your institution's policies, procedures, common sense, or good judgment. The views and opinions are those of Eric Bauer and FlightBridge Ed in their entirety. This is the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, critical care and emergency medicine education for nurses and paramedics. Here's your host, Eric Bauer. Hey everybody, Eric back with you. Today's podcast is going to be an exciting look at a study that we reviewed as far as an abstract review uh, a podcast called vasopressin, the master medication. And I did that podcast September 17th of 2017. So we're coming up on almost exactly two years since I reviewed this study and I reviewed essentially the abstract. So it's taken a couple years uh, and the paper was finally released, it was released last week, um, actually August 28th. So we are going to look at this. Um, I am going to just break down the study and I am going to throw out the gauntlet to Dr. Jeff Jarvis and Mike Verkest. And I want them to look at this on the Lighthouse Project podcast. And I want them to look at the statistical significance, break down the data and let us know, is this statistically significant? I will release that podcast on the Flatbridge side so you could hear that. And I think uh, Dr. Jarvis and Mike do a fantastic job at looking at just the pure data side. And that is definitely not a strong area. And so I am going to break down the study and kind of highlight this. I will put this study in the show notes. Again, the show notes, you have to go to the Flatbridge website, go to podcast, click on the actual podcast. And you will, when you open that podcast up, you will see an area at the bottom that says show notes. And I will have this as a PDF that you can download and save to your computer. As I said, we did do a re review on this. So I, I highly recommend going back and listening to that podcast. Again, vasopressin, the master medication. I go through a lot of different physiology of vasopressin, kind of breaking down that hormone, breaking down all the different aspects of vasopressin as it relates to SIADH, diabetes insipidus, antidiuretic hormone, you know, itself and our volume status and how we maintain that volume status. So I go into all that stuff. Uh, the podcast is just not on the advert trial. So let's break down this study. This study is called the effect of low dose supplementation of arginine vasopressin on need for blood product transfusions in patients with trauma and hemorrhagic shock. This was a randomized clinical trial by Carrie Sims et al. Uh, when we look at this, the current therapies for traumatic blood loss focus, we know, on hemorrhage control and volume replacement. And that volume replacement is blood. Severe hemorrhagic shock, however, is associated with a state of arginine vasopressin de deficiency. And the supplementation of this hormone may decrease the need for blood products in resuscitation. So I will highlight kind of how this initial study came about. And I heard this story on another podcast. Again, forgive me. I don't know where or what podcast it was. It was quite a few years ago. But Dr. Sims was highlighting a case that she had during residency. And I don't remember. I know she was either a fourth or fifth year surgical resident. This patient was post resuscitation, actually in the ICU. So she was following this patient into the ICU and the patient was decompensating, hemodynamically unstable. Um, Blood products had been administered, and I think she quoted in the podcast, exceeding eight total units of blood products. So at this point, you know, the hemorrhage had stopped. She, the patient was surgically um, um, f operated on, and those injuries were fixed. So hemorrhage had stopped, and so blood product administration had stopped as well. And we know that 
vasopressor support, and and this will be a hint. I will be doing another podcast here in another week on vasopressors in trauma, um, but I'm not going to highlight that right now. She obviously had vasopressor support on because that is actually a key treatment once that initial resuscitation phase is over. Once that hemorrhage has stopped, vasopressor support is warranted. So she had multiple vasopressors on this patient. The patient was not responding. The patient was hemodynamically unstable and, you know, about to die. So she randomly thought, hey, I wonder if vasopressin, you know, we use vasopressin in sepsis. Patients are adrenal insufficient. They become neurotransmitter um, depleted. And we know we also don't have enough stress hormone and vasopressin obviously triggers and hits on vasopressin one and two receptors. So she started a vasopressin drip and she tells a story that the patient eventually by the next morning, she was able to see a turnaround patient hemodynamically um, responded and she was able to titrate off the vasopressors and the patient did very well. And so this was something she brought to her attending. Uh, they discussed this and it was something that that he pushed her to study further because there wasn't a lot of evidence in the use of vasopressin in this type of patient. So that's where this study and this thought started. The objective of the study was to determine whether that low dose vasopressin in patients with trauma and with hemorrhage or hemorrhagic shock decreases their need for transfused blood products during resuscitation. This was a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled clinical trial, so very powerful. Um, this was on only adult trauma patients, and those ages were from 18 to 65, who received at least six units of any blood product within 12 hours of injury. This was done at University of Pennsylvania, so it was a single urban level one trauma center, and it was conducted between May 1st, 2013 and May 31st, 2017. There were exclusion criteria, um, and the exclusion criteria were any cardiac arrest prior, uh, any emergency department thoracotomy, cortical steroid use, chronic renal insufficiency, um, any coronary artery disease, traumatic brain injury, and any neurosurgical intervention, pregnancy, prisoner status, or if the patient had received any vasopressin prior to enrollment. When we look at the intervention, the intervention, again, this was a double-blinded um, trial. So after administration of a bolus dose of four units or placebo, patients were received a vasopressin at or below 0.04 units per minute. We know that's the standard high-end sepsis dose or placebo for 48 hours to maintain a mean arterial pressure at at least 65. And so as I break down this paper, that was the goal. 65 of a map was the target. And that was very, very strictly watched and observed. Made outcomes. The primary outcomes was total volume of blood products transfused. Secondary endpoints include volume of crystalloids transfused, vasopressor requirements after that initial resuscitation, secondary complications, and overall 30-day mortality. So what were the results? When we look at the sample size here, I think that's one area that we could look at and, and say, all right, the sample size isn't massive. 100 patients underwent randomization. So 47 in the vasopressin group, 51 in the placebo group. Uh, patients were primarily young. Uh, average median age was 27. And the majority were male. And the majority were penetrating trauma patients. The significant aspect here that they identified was at 48 hours, patients who received vasopressin required significantly less blood products. Now, I'm going to hit on that section at the very end of the podcast, kind of hold you in suspense, but it was really significant as far as that goes. And as I said, as far as the, the statistical data, I want Dr. Jarvis to really break this down. Now I'm going to highlight some of these key areas that the paper looks at. And as I said, if we go back to the vasopressin, the master medication, I go through this in greater detail, but we know vasopressin is a hormone secreted by the posterior pituitary in response to our osmolarity or in a hypotensive situation. We know that it's been used widely in that vasopressor um, uh, type of 
regiment in these critically ill patients. And we know vasopressin is also essential during hemorrhage and hemorrhagic shock. It's been said that about 10 to 20 percent of the total pituitary vasopressin can be released rapidly during the onset of acute blood loss. That really doesn't seem like a lot, but secretion diminishes over time. Despite persistent stimulation and low levels, this is associated with catecholamine-resistant hypotension and increased venous capacitance. So here's the problem. Patients in that trauma setting with massive hemorrhage who receive large volumes of transfusion during that resuscitation phase may risk developing that vasopressin deficiency. And that is very, very important in that first 48 hours of, of resuscitation. We also know that vasopressin has a very fixed secretion rate and has a really relative short half-life. And so that half-life is between 10 and 35 minutes. Trauma patients, as I said before, lose a large amount in that shed blood. And when we resuscitate them, whether we're using blood products or crystalloids, there's no vasopressin that you're replacing. So as such, we know that the vasopressin levels decrease dramatically in, in that severely injured patient um, who requires greater than five units of blood products. That can be a disaster. So the whole goal of this study was to supplement that vasopressin and attempt to restore serum levels so our patients can actually respond appropriately. Now, I've highlighted this in other podcasts, but we know that when we look at packed red blood cells specifically, and you look at the citrate, when they initially started studying the, the aspects of doing this study, they realized through testing that when we give these packed red blood cells, we know that the blood bank, you know, holds those black packed red blood cells up to 42 days. We're always going to be using the oldest blood. Um, that actually means that those hemoglobin are older. Uh, we know that that increases the whole inflammatory response side significantly. But it also, just within a, a few uh, hours of citrate being added, it actually destroys all the stress hormones. So that was one of the highlights of the initial preliminary research of this study was they realized that, hey, our cortisol levels, our vasopressin uh, is not being replenished. We're replacing the packed red blood cells. Um, we're replacing the FFP. We're doing the one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, but we have something missing, and that is the vasopressin. So when we look at the actual study itself, let's come back to looking at what was the main focus. They conducted this randomized double-blind clinical trial to determine whether low-dose vasopressin supplementation decreases the need for blood products in that transfusion setting in trauma with massive hemorrhage. The secondary hypothesis was that vasopressin supplementation decreased the need for resuscitative support that includes crystalloids, other vasopressors, and would result in fewer complications. As I said, this was a single center randomized clinical trial uh, between May 1st, 2013 and May 31st, 2017. It was at one facility. Trauma patients, 18 to 65 years old, who received six units or greater of overall blood products. So again, that is not just packed red blood cells within 12 hours of injury were eligible to participate. The exclusion criteria, as I said, was based on was this an interfacility transport? Was there any pre-hospital cardiac arrest? Was there any thoracotomy in the ED? Recent corticosteroid use, chronic renal insufficiency, and significant coronary artery disease, TBI, requiring a neurosurgical intervention, pregnancy, being younger than 18 or older than 65, and or a prisoner in that current state. As far as the treatments go, Vasopressin was mixed in, a, in saline with a final concentration of 0.4 units per mil 
A four-unit bolus of vasopressin or an equivalent volume of saline placebo was given before starting the study infusion. And the study infusion, as I said, was either vasopressin at 0.04 units per minute or placebo. After operating surgeon declared definitive hemorrhage control, the patient was then started on that study infusion and titrated from 0 to 0.4 units per minute to maintain a map of 65 or um, for a total of 48 hours. So uh, I think there's some pretty important things. And as I said earlier, I am going to do another podcast here in a week, and I'm going to be highlighting a, a blog that Tyler Cristofoli and Foamfrap just did. The blog was called Levafed Assisted Transfusion. And, you know, I thought that this was a very good written article, but I feel like it's a little bit um, of jumping the gun. So I'm going to highlight and really go through in a secondary podcast um, why we don't give vasopressors in trauma in that initial resuscitation phase, why it is has been proven and studied over and over, and it does uh, or has been shown to worsen outcomes. And I think that the important thing to understand is this last sentence, after the operating surgeon declared definitive hemorrhage control, the infusion was started. And I think that is the key is that we don't use vasopressors in that initial resuscitation phase, regardless if our patient has a traumatic brain injury. It is all about filling the tank with blood products and volume and getting to a perfusing map in that standard trauma patient, 65 is our goal. Um, some places even go 60, and I think that that is fine. In a traumatic brain injury, we know we go at least a map of 90. So again, I'm not going to get off on that tangent right now, but that is a perfect, perfect sentence to kind of get us into that next podcast. The study infusion, therefore, would change depending on the patient's human anatomy status, and so essentially what that's saying is, is that in the operating room or interventional suite, patients ideally were resuscitated with blood products at a one-to-one -to -one fashion. We know that that is the standard based on the proper trial. Um, after the procedure, patients receive crystalloids and blood products and at the discretion of that treating physician um, to address lactic acidosis, your output um, are H and H. So they wanted to keep the H and H, uh, you know, less than 10, or they would treat at less than 10. The other thing that I think was really cool, and, and this is based on that whole double-blinded study, is all healthcare professionals were blinded to the treatment assignment. On enrollment, a strict MAP goal of at least 65 was maintained for the next 48 hours. All vasopressor treatments were titrated and stopped before tapering the study medication. So what, essentially what that's saying is, is that the vasopressin infusion at that 0 to 0.04 units per minute was the last thing stopped and always the first thing started if that map dropped below 65. Again, remember, once they hit the six units over overall blood products, they were in, infused with a bolus dose of four units IV push. The MAP goal was determined by the consensus of multidisciplinary panel of trauma surgeons and anesthesiologists. So that's why they chose a MAP of 65. And we know that there's other thought processes on MAP. We know that ATAC guidelines now are saying in penetrating trauma um, in that initial resuscitative phase to augment them to the OR that maybe a MAP as low as 50 is warranted. Um, but again, they chose 65 as their gold standard. When we look at the endpoints, I think the endpoints and outcomes, again, when we look at that, often 30-day mortality is always a big one. Length of stay in the ICU, complications as defined by the Pennsylvania trauma outcomes, those included acute kidney injury, ARDS, mechanical ventilator free days, open abdomen free days, um, to name a few. So let's highlight the final kind of thought of this study. The study demonstrated that using low dose supplemental vasopressin in that hemorrhagic shock patient significantly decreases the need for blood products without increasing morbidity. Patients treated with that low dose vasopressin received significantly less packed red blood cells, fewer FFP units, and decreased platelet transfusions. Overall, this process led to a median transfusion reduction of one liter, and that one liter translates to a decrease of roughly three units of packed red blood cells 
or four units of FFP. And I think that is a big, big deal right there. That is significant. What about those secondary outcomes? What they identified on the secondary outcomes, vasopressin did not significantly influence resuscitation related complications such as ARDS. So there was about the same as placebo, length of mechanical ventilation, acute injury of the kidney, and damage control or open abdomen. I think it's important to look at that from the pure standpoint. I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into those secondary um, items that I just touched on. Many, many different levels and layers that we could probably do podcasts on all day long. I think that this, again, is powerful. And I think if I go back to that initial quote, resuscitation strategies that decrease the need for transfusions without increasing complications, therefore would represent a clinically important innovation. And I think that we definitely know that blood product administration is important, obviously, in that massive hemorrhage setting. We know that packed red blood cells, the citrate aspect of that leads to secondary problems. Um, we've highlighted those problems in other podcasts. We know that a lot of trauma centers and even EMS and uh, HEMS agencies are moving towards whole blood uh, because you have just a better product overall. But if we can reduce the overall infusion rate or total infusion of those blood products by maybe implementing vasopressin in that initial resuscitation phase, um, you know, maybe maybe we're onto something. I think does this translate to the pre-hospital side? Well, obviously, this study was focusing on that six-unit infusion. So they didn't get randomized until they had hit that six units of total blood products. Um, and I think that that's where it's going to be difficult to implement this. I think there has to definitely be follow-up studies uh, to look at this and, you know, maybe follow-up studies in the pre-hospital side to say, all right, well, you have a massive hemorrhage patient. Once you initiate um, that blood re re replacement, maybe give a four unit bolus dose of vasopressin and then they, you know, that would have to be continued in these different uh, sites, clinical sites. And then that would have to obviously be studied. But I definitely think from a hospital standpoint, uh, this is pretty significant. Again, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Jarvis's thoughts and input in the statistical analysis of this study. And we will obviously post this in his clinical analysis uh, based on the Lighthouse Project podcast in the Flatbridge Ed um, podcast side. So that's all I have for this podcast. Again, please go back, listen to Vasopressin, the Master of Medication. That was September 17th, 2017. Um, kind of get the highlights of vasopressin as far as the, the physiology, because I do go into quite a bit of depth in that area. And then come back and download this study from the show notes and read it and be waiting for the next two podcasts that I talk about in this episode. Until next time, thanks for everything and I will talk to you soon. This has been a production of the Flight Bridge Ed Podcast, leading the way in pre-hospital critical care and emergency medicine education.